here try you see this there's no marrow in the bone you see them scattered all over the valley they ain't even full skeletons I mean the bones are scattered all over the valley they're just bones but answer me a question Ezekiel can these bones live Ezekiel answers the only way he knows how to answer Lord you know critical race theory was born out of critical legal theory am I teaching y'all something today there emerged two common beliefs linking all critical race theories first white supremacy has subordinated black people and other people of color that's just a fact that, that, how, how in the world are you gonna fight against that being taught in any school white supremacy has subordinated black people and other people of color that's a fact why don't you want that to be taught in school you 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 let your schools teach us that Columbus discovered America that's a lie you let your schools teach us that George Washington couldn't tell a lie that's a lie you, you let your schools teach us that some slave owners were beneficent and good slave owners there were no good slave owners anybody who owned people was evil that's a lie you let your schools teach us that Abraham Lincoln was good for Negroes no Abraham Lincoln was trying to save the Union and Abe Lincoln himself said if he could save the Union and keep black people in chains he would do it that's a lie come on somebody you let them teach us about a white Jesus uh, you let them teach us uh, uh, that Native Americans were the aggressors uh, come on somebody that 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 white folk had a manifest destiny and that the pilgrims uh, were good to Native Americans that's a lie all day every day you let them teach us lies all throughout my history in school I was taught lies uh, but you got a problem with critical race theory because it teaches the truth uh, that white supremacy has subordinated black people and people of color the right to bear arms uh, let me just back up a little bit and let me take you on back to the late 1960s when Ronald Reagan was the governor of California and they were oppressing black folk and uh, a group of, of men and women uh, known as the Black Panther Party mm -hmm, decided that they were going to defend the rights of black folk and the Black Panthers uh, uh, decided that the Second Amendment wasn't just for white folk so they strapped themselves with guns and showed up at the Capitol in California and when they saw them Negroes with guns come on somebody that's why I say if you ever really want to get gun laws changed just is strap all these Negroes up to that they'll, they'll change them laws before the week is over when the Black Panthers watch this I want you to they, the, 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 the California legislator uh, passed what was called the Mulford Act was a gun control act that decided who could get guns who couldn't get guns what could be in your background what couldn't be in your background it was the first time in history that the National Rifle Association the NRA supported restrictive gun legislation all because black folk had the nerve to get strapped look at your neighbor and say neighbor go get strapped <laughs> Amen, somebody. Y'all going to say, Bishop told us to get strapped. I said it. Go get strapped. It just got real quiet up in here. But y'all already know I'm a triple P. Amen. Y'all know what a triple P is, right? A pistol packing preacher. Amen, somebody. Thank you, Jesus.
because you made it to the palace. Bless the name of the Lord. But you've got a responsibility to help somebody else make it across. Thank you, Jesus. Don't pull up the ladder because you climbed to the top. Don't blow up the bridge because you made your way across. Thank you, Jesus. But reach your hand back down the ladder and pull somebody else up out of Lodabar. Point seven WTCC. Good morning. Welcome to the Spoken Word. I'm your host, Bishop Talbert Swan the Second. And as usual, we'll be telling it like it is through cultural idioms and nuances that shape the order, ethos, and chaos of the African American experience. Words have their own vitality, they shape their own consciousness and create their own context for interpreting social and spiritual reality. The spoken word contains the power to reshape the landscape of society. Three minutes past the hour of 9 a.m. I want to thank Mr. Kenneth Barnett, bringing us up until the 9 o'clock hour with the promise. You can hear the promise every Monday morning, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., bringing you the best in gospel music, a good way to start out your Monday morning. A great way to start out your week. Good morning to everyone in the Pioneer Valley who's listening across our 4,000 watts in Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, wherever you hear us from in the Pioneer Valley. Good morning to you. Tell a friend, tell somebody the bishop is on the air to our streaming audience all over Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever. Rep your city, rep your town. Let me know where you're chiming in from. What's going on? I see my son Trey is in the house um, on Instagram. I know my daughter Whitney is on Facebook, her preferred method of listening. To each and every one of you, rep your city, rep your town. Let me know where you're chiming in from. Tell a friend, tell somebody, like, share, subscribe, all of that kind of stuff. Um um, so that people can get the message. Listen, today I'm going to be talking about the commodifying of black death. The commodifying of black death. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is in the house. They're already repping, already repping, y'all. Y'all got to get, y'all got to get up on your game. You got to move a little faster. Um, um, commodifying black death. People are profiting off of black death. Some monetarily, others in terms of trying to build a reputation, uh, trying to build a public profile um, off of black death. We're going to talk about that. 413-337-1866. Um, I got Atlanta in the house. I got Dallas, Texas in the house. I got Houston up in the house. Come on, come on. I got North Kakalaki. North Carolina is up in here. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is up in here. 
All right, they up in the house today. Where, where my Springfield folk at? Where, 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 where y'all think because I'm here, y'all don't have to rep? Come on now. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Well, I need a beaming pitch. Uh, Springfield, Massachusetts is definitely up in the house. Um, te- once again, tell a friend, tell somebody. Bishop is on the air right now. We got something to talk about, family. Got something that we need to holler about. Listen, y'all like this on last week. A lot of you all were asking um, about this song. This song is called Don't Stop. It's a motivational talk uh, by Ferris Hill, F-A-I-R-E-S-T Hill, H-I-L-L. For those of you uh, who want to check it out, um, don't stop. We'll be right back after this. Don't y'all go nowhere. The essence of life is to grow, grow. But the essence of growth is change. The being in the road would be the end of the road if you refuse to change. Reach a little higher, reach a little higher, dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, go a little further, go a little further. Come on, come on, come on, reach a little higher, come on, yeah, dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, go a little further, go a little further. Come on, don't stop. The essence of life is growth, but the essence of growth is change. The being in the road will be the end of the road if you refuse to change. Your life will never change until you get disgusted with where you are. Whatever you don't hate is what you tolerate. You must learn from the past, plan for the future, and live for the day. For it is your daily routine that determines your success or failure in life. It's the choices that you have made up until this point that would determine the rest of your life. So break the cycle that doing enough is simply good enough. You only get out what you put in, so don't settle for the crumbs when you can have a whole loaf. So push yourself push beyond your limitations. Come on. Reach a little higher. Reach a little higher. Dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. Go a little further. Don't stop. Don't stop. Come on. Don't Reach stop. a little higher. Dig a little deeper. Go a little further. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. So you gotta break the routine of trying to beat the system. Manipulators will always try to bypass the process of free progress. There are no shortcuts to success. There are no elevators to the top. You gotta take it one step at a time. You gotta break the routine of allowing others to get into your head to control who you are and where you're going. You see, when you're about to positive, you're going to always have haters. But don't let your haters push you down. Let your haters push you forward to the next level. So when people show you who they really are, don't perceive them to be something else that they're not. See, a zebra does not change his stripes. So you got to keep pushing yourself to the next level. Yeah, there you go. Come on. Come on. You gotta understand the greatness is the nature that you were born out of. You'll never discover your greatness without hard work and dedication. Greatness says more about who you are. And what you expect for yourself. And greatness will always attract greatness. Show me your friends and I'll show you the future. The future. You just a step away. You just a step, step away. away. You just a step away. Don't ever give up. Come on. You just a step away. Come on, y'all. You just a step away. You got to push yourself beyond your limitations. Come on, rep your city, rep your town. You see, there's no mountain too Where y'all in here from? No valley too low. You can go where you want to go. It's all in the power of your imagination. If you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. So stretch yourself. Take yourself. Stretch yourself, y'all. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get a little higher. Go a little deeper. Go a little further. Come on. Don't stop. Don't stop. Come on. Go a little higher. Go a little further. Go a little further. Don't, don't stop. Don't stop. Come on. There's a blessing waiting on you. Come on. Blessings are coming your way. I got to give you all this prophecy now. 
He about to prophesy to y'all. Come on, receive it. Don't stop. Don't stop until you get your dream. Don't stop. Get your dream. Until you get your dream. Come on. Don't stop until you get your dream. Don't stop. Get your dream. Come on. Yes. Yeah. Don't stop. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go for the gold. Come on. You gotta go for the gold. You gotta go for the gold. Don't stop. Don't stop. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Burgess, good morning. Donald Brown, good morning. Blessings are coming your way. Yes. That's Don't Stop by Ferris Hill, those of you who are asking. We're coming right back. This is called I Like What I See by Rhonda Swan. Stephanie Johnson, good morning. Lyle Seymour, good morning. Keyshawn Dodds, good morning. Juanita Beeman, good morning. Uh, Pam Grayson, good morning. Aunt Marion, good morning. Linda good morning, Green, Keith Hughes, all y'all. Right. A strong, beautiful black woman staring back at me. We've seen a lot of pain, but I've had her share of sorrow. But he never gave up hope for a fight of tomorrow. I've been lied to, cheated on, and stolen yeah, from and hit me. But it just made me stronger, and I refused to quit. That's right. And though I've been tempted, I refused to stoop to their level. I was above yeah. any nonsense and made a liar of the devil. All right. The devil who said I wasn't good enough, cute enough, or worthy of love. I kicked his butt with divine power from above. Power that says I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me and brought me out of darkness so that I can see that I'm smart, I'm beautiful, I'm a child of the King. Abundant love for me, He came to bring. Oh, yes, when I look in the mirror, I love what I see. That strong, beautiful black woman, that woman is me. Good morning. Welcomes, welcomes, welcomes to the spoken word with Bishop Talbert Swan. The second coming up at half past the hour. We've got um, we've got Senator Eric Lesser uh, who will be coming in, giving us our state house update. Um, and then at 10 o'clock, uh, we move into um, justice and flow. So stay with us. A um, lot to talk about today. Um, today we're dealing with commodifying of black death. Good morning to everybody who's chiming in from everywhere. Uh, those of you who are on the gram, those of you who are on Facebook, those of you who are on YouTube. Once again, Rep Your City, Rep Your Town. Let me know where you're chiming in from. Um, part of the world. Good morning to those of you in the Twitter space. You can definitely put your request in if you want to be part of today's conversation. Um, and of course, the rest of you can, uh, can call in at uh, 413 337 1867. 413 337 1867. It's May now. It's May, May 2022. And it was two years ago. Um, you all will remember. Um, at the murder of George Floyd in May of There were nationwide protests and civil actions that took place. We were right in smack dab. Uh, in the middle of sheltering in place in this pandemic, people were beginning to feel the frustration um, because they thought that this was going to be a you know a couple of weeks, they'd be out a month or so, they'd be back out back to normal. They would have got a grip on the pandemic, um, and that didn't happen. So we were sheltering in place. They were restricting um, everything. If you remember, we, we couldn't even have Easter celebration, our resurrection services, all of that uh, was put on hold 
Uh, my brother Juan Winans, what's happening there, fella? Good to see you, bro. Um, um, all of that was going on, and and we were frustrated. And then we were looking at this this video of George Floyd being murdered on the street like a dog, um, and it sparked these worldwide protests. One of the questions I was asked, I was doing an interview with New England Public Radio um, the other day, and they wanted to know what happened to all of that energy that, that, that folks had two years ago. Where did it go? You know, because the issues haven't gone away. No, we may not have seen a video of someone kneeling on someone's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds like we did with George Floyd. But the murder, the, the extrajudicial murder of black people didn't stop in May of 2020. Where did all that energy go? Um, you know, uh, 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 Professor 45 says the weather got cold. You know, you know we've had, we've had, we've had winter, spring, summer and fall twice since then um, um and, and i like to say uh that our liberal counterparts particularly our white liberal counterparts part of their motivating factor was also the fact that you had donald trump in office you had a republican administration in charge um and a lot of those protests were also political to make the administration look bad and to stoke up their base uh, to get ready for the um, national presidential elections. And once that happened and their guy got in, they went stage left on the movement. I, I mean, seriously, that's what happened. They went stage left on the movement. It's like, and see, that's the difference. I always tell people the difference between black folk and so-called allies is we don't get to opt out. You know, our struggle against injustice is perpetual. As long as I've got this black skin, you know, I, I, I don't just get to opt out and go back. See, they can opt out, go back to their white life. And then when they want to jump back in, they can jump back in. But now that Biden's in office, it seems like racism, racism isn't as bad as it was under Trump. And of course, we know that's that, that's ridiculous, um, but really, that's that's how they act. That's how they act. You know, when, when it happens under a Democrat administration, it's like, be patient, just wait. You know, don't be divisive. All that kind of stuff is what they say. Um, but as long as as I'm, you know, railing against. Uh, 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 an administration they don't like, then they're down with that. Um, hey, I want y'all to listen to this piece. This is this is um, this is what I part of what I said to my congregation on yesterday about this very issue. I want you to hear it. Racism, racism, regardless of whether there's a hold on, hold on, hold. On. Let me get it. Let me let me let me get it right so that you all can can hear it because you need to know racism doesn't change it doesn't become more palatable simply because the Democrats are in charge. Racism is racism regardless of whether there's a Democrat in office or a Republican in office. We can't have all this liberty and all this smoke when Donald Trump is in office. And then pretend the same things are going on just because your boy Biden got there. We can't complain that Trump used a racist policy to pretend that Haitians uh, oppose a threat to America to deport 6,700 of them out of America when Biden put that policy in place so he could deport 40,000 Haitians using the same racist policy if it was racist and wrong when, when the other guy did it, it's racist and wrong now. I need for us to have the same energy. Amen. 
no matter who's in office. Racism is now. Now I want y'all to get that. We, we we need to have the same energy. You know, we can't be. You know, and I often use this as an example. When Tim Scott, um, when Tim Scott said America is not a racist country, the left went ham. They drug him for filth. Um, Uncle Tim, Uncle Tom, Coon, Sambo, you name it. You name it. But the next day, when Kamala Harris said the same thing, and when James Clyburn said the same thing that Tim Scott said, two leading Democrats, the Vice President of the United States, and the Majority Whip of the U.S. House of Representatives, said the same thing. And black folks had no smoke for them. How the hell y'all gonna have smoke for somebody because they're a Republican and they say something out the side of their face? But then when a Democrat says the exact same thing, you ain't got no smoke. It can't be crazy and racist if a Republican says or does it, and then it ceases to be simply because of the party affiliation of a Democrat who says or does it. We, we've got to be consistent. We've got to be consistent, y'all. Racism doesn't change based upon what party is in charge. Let me get back to where I was trying to go. Um, the corporate response to the national and the worldwide expressions of outrage two years ago over the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmoud Arbery, and George Floyd is telling. But of what? Certainly racism didn't become more egregious it didn't suddenly become more overt or more immoral um it, it didn't suddenly become clear it was always clear at least it was clear to black people um you know how little our humanity is valued in america but the swell of public indignation that happened uh, during that time was sparked and fueled by intense expressions of hurt and anger, particularly in the black community. Um, and it made it impossible for even multi-billion dollar corporations to ignore those manifestations of racism. And so they, we had these mass protests everywhere, just everywhere. We, we, we had them here in our city in late May, early June. Um, and, and, and what happened was there were scores of U.S. Uh, companies that were struck. It's like they all got a sudden epiphany. You know, uh, they they, 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 they they got a sudden revelation about um, the reality of being black in America. And so what they started doing, many of them started ordering their public relations departments to publicly demonstrate that they were allies with the black community. Um, these same organizations while paying lip service to their intolerance for racism. Many of them have abysmal records of supporting black people in practice. A lot of them were putting out advertisements. They were spending money. Matter of fact, here in our city, Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company gave half a million dollars to the Urban League. They didn't really check and see what grassroots organizations were actually active uh, in pushing for police reform, they just said, "Yeah, let's give it to a, a, a safe organization and pretend like that we care about these Negroes." And they have a horrendous record when it comes to racial discrimination and how they treat their employees. Just a fact. 
Um, you take companies like Amazon. Um, it was right after the George Floyd incident. They, they put up on their homepage, some of y'all will remember, that they stood in solidarity with the black community. And they bragged about donating $10 million to organizations supporting justice and equity. All right. And then they advertised that they raised the Pan-African flag um, um, in Seattle to honor black history and to celebrate the meaning of the flag, and yada, 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 yada. So on and so forth. But then Amazon, at the same time they were doing all of this, they were aggressively opposing the efforts of many of its employees, nearly 30% of whom are black, to organize to get better pay and safe working conditions. So they were given lip service to standing in solidarity with the black community, yet aggressively opposing their black employees trying to get better pay and better working conditions. <clears throat> Just complete hypocrisy. And, and then you had other multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations that capitalized on the moment and they, they wanted to declare this heartfelt solidarity with the black community. You had McDonald's who was talking about, you know, we stand for the victims of systemic oppression and violence. You had Coca-Cola who bragged about donating um, to a hundred black men of America and the National Cares Mentoring Movement and about having an effort to end systemic racism. You had Adidas. Uh, Adidas was saying that the success of Adidas would be nothing without black athletes, black artists, black employees, and black consumers. And that's true. But Adidas had never supported black people. Target. I mean, come on now. Target committed $10 million in ongoing resources to rebuild efforts and advance social justice. And 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 let me tell you why they did this. It, they didn't do this because they, they got a conscience. They didn't do this because they all of a sudden became altruistic. They didn't do this because they decided to change their policy and their stances on how they treat black people and how they respond to what is happening to black people in the public sphere. They did this because they understood who their consumers were. They understood the black dollar. Come on now. They understood who was buying their products. Yes, their consumers. They understood the buying power of the black community and the reality that perception in the eyes of their customers is everything. And so you had this inherent hypocrisy. It was downright insulting. It was shameless opportunism. And it was blatant. Um, when, when, when you examine the actual relationship of these companies to how they treat their employees and customers of whom are black, it ain't hard to see from their practices and policies that they have never had the welfare of the black community at heart. Take Walmart, for instance notorious for exploiting low-wage employees. They've made use of prison labor to increase profits. Um, but then they had the nerve after the death of George Floyd, the, the, the CEO, Doug McMillian, to talk about the deep-seated issues related to injustice, inequality, and fairness. How the hell Walmart going to talk about fairness and and the deep-seated problems of injustice? And then they had the nerve to say to the black community, 
uh, we hear you, we see you. I want you to know you are valued. And then they committed a hundred million dollars uh, to create a new center on racial equity that was supposed to support philanthropic initiatives related to the criminal justice system and other areas. But they haven't treated their employees any better. And I, and, and I suggest to you that a much better use of Walmart's $100 million would have been to increase wages, to improve health care for its 340,000 black workers in the United States. Rather than using uh, philanthropy as a convenient cover, because you got to remember, philanthropy provides them a tax write-off. All right? But they didn't want to use that money to increase wages or give better working conditions. 413-337-1867. Let's bring the senator on, and then we'll come back to our conversation. Senator Lesser. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me? I can. What's good? Oh, how's it going? Uh, we, we, get, we, we missed a month, so we got, we got extra, extra lot to catch up on today. Absolutely, absolutely. What's been happening? Oh, it's been busy. We, uh, we, um, the House did their budget last week, so the Senate's getting ready for our budget in a couple of weeks. We're going to do that at the end of May. Okay. Uh, we did sports betting last week. That was big. That had been going on for, uh, for a long time. Uh, we did a uh, cannabis uh, equity bill. Uh, a few weeks before that. Uh, we also passed the Crown Act uh, a few weeks ago as well. Uh, and we, and the governor filed his uh, economic development bill. So we're gonna be doing hearings on that soon. So this is the busy, busy period for the for the legislature, but uh, all, all good stuff. All right, Any anything uh, special in the budget? Well, we're gonna be keeping an eye on a, on a bunch of things. Uh, for one, uh, just the continued making sure that we've got our job training programs funded. You know, we've got really big shortages now. I'm sure people are getting hurt from the price increases. We need to do a lot more to get people trained, get, uh, get good workers out the door. I'm gonna be really focused on closing the wait list at our vocational schools, which is a really uh, big issue, certainly in Springfield and in our broader region in Western Mass. Uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on the uh, on the conference for the Crown Act. Make sure that gets signed into law soon. Uh, that's really really important. And uh, we had really big news last week, also on rail service. I don't know if people saw, but uh, Governor Baker kind of shook our hand and said that they're going to be working with us to try to get this service up and running between Springfield and Boston. Congressman Neal and Congressman McGovern were big parts of that and were helped broker that meeting as well. So a lot, lot going on, a lot of things we're going to be focused on. We got to get sports betting done. I personally feel it's time to get that done because Connecticut and New York have done it uh, recently and we're, uh, we're, we're losing money by, uh, by not acting on that. Now there was uh, two things. There was a push um, in terms of sports betting to try to ensure that it included bars and restaurants etc cetera, etc cetera, because of so many um, um constituents from the black and non-white community that would not have access otherwise uh was that part of the legislation or or tell me about that? yeah no it's a really important question so this the legislation the senate did uh we create two types of licenses uh, a category one license which would be granted to the existing casinos Plain Ridge, Encore in Boston, MGM in Springfield, and then a Category 2 license, and there'd be six of those uh, that would be uh, people could apply to throughout the state. That uh, There will be four criteria that the Gaming Commission will use to award those licenses, uh, and one of the four criteria will be commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, including minority hiring and minority ownership. Uh, which is a, an important component. We also included an amendment from Senator Gomez, uh, my colleague in Springfield, to include really important data requiring requirements. So they're going to have to be reporting to us almost in real time how that goes. Uh, there was a there were there were some proposals on the table 
uh, around uh, giving kind of local restaurants, local sports bars uh, access to gaming licenses. Uh, that did not go through. A lot of people felt that that was a, probably an expansion of gaming beyond what people thought were comfortable with because it would essentially turn every restaurant uh, and every bar into a casino. Uh, and there were a lot of people, a lot of members of the Senate that just weren't comfortable with that at this point. So I think we got to a good place with that language for the Gaming Commission. We got uh, Senator Gomez's amendment included, which was good news. Um, and so now we just got to make sure we hold that in the negotiations with the House. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, for those who don't know, um, tell them what the Crown Act is about. Yeah, uh, yeah, I apologize for using an acronym for that. Yeah, because people might not, uh, it doesn't really describe it. But so the Crown Act uh, is would be a new law that would ban discrimination based on natural hairstyles. Uh, and this has come up actually many times, most prominently, although it happens in a lot of venues, but most uh, prominently it's come up in athletics uh, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, African-American athletes uh, who are wearing their natural hairstyle the massachusetts um you know athletic associations and the rules around the sports had said that they couldn't have those hairstyles and there had actually been cases where actually at the matches or at the sidelines of the competitions their braids or their hairstyle their hair was literally cut off uh, and there had been you know documented cases of this this has happened for a long time so a group of constituents actually in massachusetts had been uh um pushing to make this, you know, to obviously ban this practice. So the House did this, I want to say maybe two months ago. Uh, it, was, it was it was a little bit earlier in the year. The Senate took it up recently the last few weeks. So we just got to get the two now uh, reconciled, get it on the governor's desk. Once that's done, and I do think we will get it done very soon, uh, we're going to ban discrimination based on natural hairstyle. So schools, athletic associations, employers would not be able to say to someone, you have to cut your braids. You have to have a certain. Uh, you have to have a certain hairstyle. Uh, you know, because uh, you know it's obviously uh, people should be allowed to wear their natural hairstyle. And it's honestly like, I was sort of shocked that this wasn't already illegal when this was first presented to me. So um, yeah, I'm grateful that we were able to get it done pretty quickly once uh, once this got thought. And, and Senator Gomez was one of the key sponsors of this legislation. So we had a you know a good local partner working on it. And, and it goes beyond um, sports. It, it does happen uh, predominantly in sports, but it goes beyond that. Um, we, we know of some, uh, there were some Christian schools who were telling young black boys who had dreadlocks that that, that, you know, that was against their religious standing or something and, and, and was telling them to cut their hair and, and so we see it in in other facets of life as well no absolutely yeah certainly not limited just to sports the, the probably the highest profile examples have probably been um in sports but it's been certainly in schools also there was a, a lot of examples that we saw in in the in the hearings and the testimony around employment uh and employers so it's really important in, in the employment context uh that, that that discrimination be banned as well absolutely uh, and other than, than than being busy with um, what's happening legislatively, um, I'm sure you've been campaigning. Absolutely, I know we've been really busy. I was in um, I was in Hyannis uh, over the weekend. I was in Canton and in Falmouth and in Hyannis. Uh, today, I'm on my way to Worcester. Uh, for an event in Worcester. We're, we're getting very uh, close to our signature deadline, so that's going to be done soon. And then we've got this, the Democratic Convention June 5th in Worcester as well uh, that we're building towards. So if people want to get involved in my lieutenant governor race, they can check it out at ericlesser.com. Again, ericlesser.com. Certainly love people's help because we're, we're getting into the into the uh, into the intense phase here as the convention comes up, comes pretty close, and so then we uh, move into the summer months. Gotcha. Tell everybody how to get in touch with you. Yeah, well, thanks, Bishop. So people can uh, call my office, 413, of course, 526-6501. Again, 526-6501 for people in Western Mass, 413-526-6501 anywhere else. Uh, ericlesser.com on the campaign side, senatorlesser.com on the Senate side. People can also check me out on Twitter, at Eric Lesser, on Instagram, at Eric Lesser. And on Facebook, Eric Lesser MA, or send me uh, an old fashioned email. I can't believe email is old fashioned now, eric.lesser 
at macenate.gov. And we've got a, we've got a, um, uh, uh, for, for people in, for anyone listening in Springfield, we've got a, our um, office hours coming up at the 16 Acres Library uh, this week. So people can also check us out there. All right, Splinter, always a pleasure. I, I'm sure you're going to stay busy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you too. Yeah, <laughs> it takes one to know one. You you keep pretty busy too, Bishop. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. All right, we'll talk soon. Take right. care. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. 413-337-1867. Our State House update every first Monday uh, by Senator Eric Lesser, who is running for Lieutenant Governor uh, as well. Um, oh, oh, there we go. Yeah. I knew somebody was going to call in at some point. Good morning, caller. Good morning, and God bless you, Bishop. Uh, the senator is still on the line because I'm a little concerned and confused. We're all listening to you, even me, when you say don't vote for white Democrats. But Eric Lesser is a white Democrat, and he they chose to put sporting before cannabis, which cannabis is legal. It is three billion dollars in the state of Massachusetts. So, um, this legal stuff about gambling, I appreciate Mr. Adam finally. I mean, I don't disrespect Adam. I have my own personal view, but I appreciate him talking about how it's going to be so rude and racist to all of us. Even I, Bishop, could afford to gamble. But how? So we, why won't we have, why would we give NGM and all these other people another license? Don't they already have a license and they already keep us out of there, those who can't get in? Sellers are not legally allowed to get an apartment, they can't get a job, and nor can they go inside an NGM or any gambling casino. So I think that Mr. Lesser should have did something to nominate a black person out of the area of Springfield. You, we've been through so much, and he still always comes to you to only ask you to gather up all the black folks, Bishop, because we need to get through. Sorry, what is coming in for us? And I thank you for your call. Thank you for your call. <sighs> anyway, four one three 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 seven eighteen sixty seven. Oh, boy, in case you hadn't noticed, there's a black woman running for Secretary of State. There's a black woman who has a good chance of getting in as Attorney General. Uh, there are black women all over the place right now. There's a black woman who just left here who is the U.S. Attorney. Um, anyway. 413-337-1867. And we were talking about these corporations and stuff profiting off of black death. Um, right up at Cam in Cambridge, Harvard, um, um, talked about the senseless killing of George Floyd uh, at the hands of police. And, and they gave a lot of lip service um, around justice and so on and so forth yet harvard um uh, you know has a horrendous record when it comes to dealing with black students um who have suffered due to the actions or the inaction of that university which regularly profits from the suffering of black poor and disenfranchised people Matter of fact, Harvard just um, came out with um, something where they were donating, I think, a hundred million dollars or something to deal with its legacy and history um, on the enslavement of black people. Um, in case you didn't know, Harvard, which is the wealthiest university in the world, gets a portion of its $40.9 billion endowment, let me say that again, $40.9 billion endowment from its holdings in companies that profit from the prison industrial complex. Harvard invested in insurance companies that insured slave owners. Um, if it were to divest its holdings 
and reinvest in communities most deeply impacted by mass incarceration. Um, it'd be a much more genuine show of solidarity with the black community than the dissemination of letters and webinar panels on racial equity. Um, and I've talked a lot about corporations and their hypocrisy um, when it comes to black death. But there are also individuals who parade around as activists. We call them actorvists who benefit off of black death. People who literally have raised their public profile. Um, um, and, I, and, and I'm not against anybody diversifying their streams of income and making a living and all of that. Uh, but there are a number of people who use black death for that particular purpose. They want notoriety. They want a book deal. They want to get on television. You know, they want a pseudo celebrity status. So they use incidents where particularly black men get murdered by police as their springboard, as their platform. There's so many who came up out of the Ferguson movement who are now, you know, considered celebrities. Brittany Packnett and so many others um, who made their name off of activism allegedly you know fighting for justice but now they're more concerned with book deals and um contracts for to be uh, um, talking heads and correspondence on television shows etc etc et um doing commercials and getting on the Grammy Awards and all of that kind of stuff. And once again, you know, I know people go, oh, you just hating because no, no. I'm concerned when, when it seems that people are more invested in building a profile than building nation, than building community, than building solidarity and calling for justice. And you have it on different levels. You have the extreme levels that I'm talking about. And you and you got it on the local level. You, you have people who have never in their life um, done anything constructive or, or that would be beneficial to the black community who all of a sudden become activists in the wake of black death. And they want to be the mouthpiece that speak for black people or for families that are suffering. This ain't about, this thing isn't about television interviews and newspaper articles. This is about a commitment to bettering the life of our people. This is about sacrifice. And, and I speak of it from experience. It's about sacrifice because you literally, you literally sacrifice potentially your livelihood. You have people who won't give you opportunities, who won't hire you for jobs, who, who will make sure that you don't get contracts or grants or anything like that because of your public stance. And it'll trickle down to your children. I've had people say they wouldn't hire my children because they don't like me. It, 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 it's about the stress and trauma of fielding death threats on a regular basis. I literally have an FBI agent assigned to me who receives all the death threats. I just forward them to him. When I get them, I forward them to him. I was on the phone last week with my victim witness advocate from the U.S. Department of Justice who was updating me on several cases. 
of individuals who are being investigated for threatening to murder me. This is, this is, this is, that stuff happens like it's Monday, it's Tuesday. You know, literally, you know, um, on a weekly basis, somebody is threatening to put a bullet in my head or to murder my family or, and, and we have to live with the stress and, 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 and trauma and uncertainty of that because you know there are some crazy people out there. Um, you know, I remember the district attorney. Well, he didn't like the position that I took against the police where well, he tried to frame me himself. He tried to say I sent a fax to myself, which was from the police department, threatening me. And he called me in and said he would indict me unless I apologized publicly. And I told him I was there with my uncle at the district attorney's office. I looked him in his face and I told him Satan would be ice skating before I apologized for something I didn't do. I said, Go ahead. And, and call a grand jury and indict me. I will sue you and this entire city. And I walked out of his office. He never did anything because he never had a case. But that's what happens. I, I've, I've had police officers trump up charges. Literally, trump up charges. And then, and then call the newspaper to tell the newspaper on such and such a date, Bishop Swan is going to be in court because he wanted the newspaper to go there to cover it. I've had the police plot to arrest me in public places. There was a police officer who came by my church to warn me that we had a, a rally set for downtown Springfield. And I was scheduled to be one of the keynote speakers. And he told me there was an old 1986 speeding ticket from the Boston area. And the police were going to wait until I got on stage to come up to arrest me so they could publicly embarrass me. And because of that warning, we were able to take care of that speeding ticket and call it a day. They will try to set you up. They will try to embarrass you. They will try to cut off your livelihood. They will try to ruin your reputation. They will threaten to murder you. They will physically attack you. This ain't no game. This ain't about being popular. This ain't about getting followers on social media. But there are so many who want to use black death to get credibility. They want to use black death to raise their profile and to make themselves seem to be important. This ain't what that's about. It's never been about that for me and for many others. And we've got to stop with the divisive games in our community. We have enough to deal with with our open enemy, let alone trying to cause hate and discontent within the community. Listen, here's the deal. If you don't like what someone's organization is doing or someone is doing, you don't have to. And you don't have to support them. But you don't have to publicly try to slander them. Okay? Just keep it moving. Do your thing and keep it moving. Understand, different organizations have different missions and will do different things. Different people have different goals and will and different passions and will do different things. There are some people who are passionate about the prison industrial complex and they work with the incarcerated. There are some people who are passionate about helping the homeless. There are people who are passionate 
about women's issues, who are passionate about our youth. We need all of them. But the person who's working with the homeless shouldn't be throwing shots at the person who's working with the prisoners to say they're not doing the right thing because they're not doing what they want to do. We got to stop that foolishness. And when the NAACP or, or at our partners like the Pioneer Valley Project and others are, are doing certain things that, that's part of our mission, let us do our mission. If you want to support it, support it. If you don't, you don't have to. Good morning, Paula. Good morning, Bishop. I'm so proud to have a strong black man standing up for what's right in the black community. We need more men like you, men of courage, men of strength, men of power, and men of honor. And I commend you, Bishop Bishop Swan, because we need you. We need this to feed our soul, to help us get through every day in America. And without you, we would just fall asleep. And you're giving the voice of the voiceless. And I appreciate you so much. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work and your hard work and your efforts to raise awareness. And all of those who are hating, let them keep on hating. God bless you and your family, and no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. Thank you, my sister. I appreciate your call, and I appreciate your words of encouragement. Yes, sir. God bless. God bless. Take care. 413-337-1867. Three minutes left in the program before we move on to justice and flow. Um, it, I, I mean, it, it's just that, that simple. We don't need to be at each other's throats. There are certain things that arise for social justice does that we don't do. You know, they, they, they do a lot of work with the homeless. They do a lot of work with, with, with sex workers. There's things that PVP does that we don't do. PVP does a lot of work with resettling refugees, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do that work. Um, but we don't, we don't criticize them because they're not more vested in what we want to do. Um, um, and so, you know, this nonsense about making live videos so you can dog out other uh, community-based organizations, that's foolery. That's pure foolishness. And let me say this to all like-minded organizations. I don't expect for you to include the NAACP in everything that you do. Where it makes sense that we partner, we can partner. But you have no obligation as you're going about your day-to-day -day work and planning you don't have to put us on every press release you send out. You don't have to include us in every public event you do. So there's no need to get offended if the NAACP or the Pioneer Valley Project or whoever it is doesn't include you on theirs. That ain't about exclusion. That's about accomplishing a mission. That's about partnering with who it makes sense to partner with at that time. So let's let us let us stop playing games. Good morning, caller. Good morning, Bishop Swan. Um, calling from the Greater Chicago Land area. Good morning. Good morning, and I just wanted to thank you um, for everything you are doing. Um, I, I would say, in addition to being a bishop, you are one of the greatest professors of um, all time of issues affecting black people in this country. Thanks a million. I know time is short, but um, I learned about you through a documentary, and I have just been um, just enamored in a godly sense. Um, I just want to thank you, man. Welcome you that I have from some of my college courses. Thank you, and Lady Swan, and God bless you. All right, thank you so much, sister. All right, we got to move out from uh the spoken word getting ready for justice and flow so stay with us those of you uh in the listening audience um on the radio if you want to continue with us move on over to social media uh any of our social media platforms uh twitter youtube instagram facebook um and we'll continue on with justice and flow if you're looking for a place to worship check us out at the spring of hope church of god in christ 35 alden street springfield massachusetts 11 o'clock a.m 
on Sunday and Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. for Bible study. Listen, Pioneer Valley, until the next time I talk to you and you talk to me, always remember God loves you and so do I. To our social media audience, stay with us. We'll continue on with Justice and Flow. We'll be right back. God bless. Was produced by my son, the birthday boy. His 15th birthday, so y'all put in the comments, put a shout out to Micah Azir. It's his 15th birthday. peoples we are here we're in the hizzy i see we got a troll on youtube <laughs> we definitely do not need more racists like you <laughs> god bless everybody welcome we're here good what's morning. happening good morning justice how you doing how you doing as Wendy Williams say, how you doing? I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. Ready. Can we get I'm, to the show first? I need some grits. Yes, yes, it's our baby boy's birthday. Thank you, everybody. Keep sending the love. Keep sending the love. He's truly black boy, joy, uh, personified. He is an encapsulation a reflection of everything that is good about our family. He is um, a wonderful child to raise. And um, he just brings so much joy to us as parents, but he brings a lot of joy to his siblings. 
and uh, also his nieces and nephews. Good morning, Mother Fields. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. This is the day that the Lord has made. Um, I'm happy um, to, I'm, I'm just happy. I'm just happy. I don't need to explain it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. I'm still here. I'm still yeah. here. I'm still here. I made it. I made it. You didn't clap your hands, though. Well, you know, that's because you was just singing. Okay. <laughs> I was given instructions. I said, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. I don't need no instructions from you. Okay. But good morning, everybody, to another edition of Justice and Flow. So happy that um, you tuned in this morning. I, I, I love what I was hearing on the spoken word broadcast. Um, you know, I, I, I think about you often, babe, because I'm like, huh, you need to learn how to take a break because, and I, the reason why I'm saying that is because you're always in the thick of it when it comes to, you know, social justice and social justice is so heavy and it's so deep and it's so weighted. You know, you need to learn how to escape sometimes. So I feel like justice and flow is going to be an escape sometimes, you know. So I plan on pivoting a little bit from your topic and uh, talking about something else. But before I do that, I did want to uh, bring up a couple of more shout outs as uh, everybody knows already. Good morning, Sister Mathis. Good morning. Hey, we wit you know. Um, but I wanted to um, also shout out the Garden Queens. Uh, those of you who have been listening and following us, uh, you know that I brought on Sister Anna Muhammad onto the show and we talked about gardening and we talked about um, the importance of us knowing how to grow and supplement our foods um, and really establishing um, more stable um kitchens in our homes and for our families really and, um so we're starting that community garden project we are moving forward bishop thank you so much for the p permission and approval in using some of our field space uh on the campus of spring of hope i'm so excited we will be on site this weekend uh we've been meeting we're still in the um we're still in the fundraising part. Uh, we do know that we need to raise about two thousand uh, dollars to really, you know, have everything that we need uh, and to really do a really good job, sufficient job with the community garden on the, again on the campus of Spring of Hope Church of God in Christ, located at thirty five Alden Street in Springfield. Um, so, if you um, still are interested in making donations again you can forward those donations to my cash app at dollar sign cynthia swan c-y-n-t-h-i-a-s-w-a-n and i definitely wanted to thank everybody who have already sent some donations so we have a little bit in our treasure in our treasure already and so uh thank you again thank you again for believing in this uh it's really getting some positive feedback uh it's picking up some momentum so this is much more than just raising food uh, we really feel like bishop is a ministry and it's about bringing the community together and it's about raising people so that's what we're all about and again uh if you um if you want to make a donation you can forward that to uh, my cash app, dollar sign Cynthia Swan. Or if you uh, would like to make donations of supplies and materials that we need, because we need garden tools, we need wood, we need nails, we need, you know, we need a whole lot of uh, different things. We need soil. Uh, we would like to, oh, thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Sister Rhonda. Just got a cash app. I just heard the notification. So thank you, Sister Rhonda. Um, 
you know, but we need a lot of other supplies and materials. Uh, we we do want you to know that we plan on going strictly organic. So we don't want any GMO infused seeds or, or plants or anything like that. Um, but if you want more information, if you need more information, please feel free to inbox me on my Facebook at Cynthia Davis Swan, Cynthia Davis Swan on Facebook. You can contact me that way if you don't already have my contact information. So again, thank you so much for everybody. Listen, we got a phenomenal group, Bishop. We got a phenomenal group of women from all over the community that's ready for this. And we're just ready to learn. We're ready to really, you know, make a difference in our community. And uh, we're just excited. We really feel this is divine. We really feel like God is leading us to do this. And again, we want to make sure the Garden Queens want to make sure that we show love and appreciation to Sister Anna Muhammad. She's a real, she's the real MVP with all of this. She has so much knowledge. She has so much passion about this work and uh, she's a real icon. She's a living icon in this community and we just appreciate her so much and the fact that she's willing to do this free of charge and, um, and uh, uh, you know, to uplift the community is just amazing. So we're praying for her continued strength and um, her life. Um, so I wanted to say that and then I wanted to acknowledge um, that I will be, or we will be, you know, the Justice and Flow show that is, we will be uh, creating a special edition of Justice and Flow to talk about the Crown Act being passed. I'm so excited about that. It's such a, a critical bill um, that's been passed here in Massachusetts. Um, I mean, it means so much to me as a black woman, but I, I really do believe that it means a lot to the black community of uh, the, the fact that, you know, th this bill says that we cannot be discriminated against for wearing our natural hair and wearing our natural hairstyles as we so please. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about having that conversation. So it will be a special edition of Justice and Flow uh, created and that'll be coming up soon. Um, so I wanted to make those shout outs with Bishop today. Now I can pivot uh, to today's topic. Okay, it's only 13 minutes after 10. I do think that this is going to take up the rest of the show. Um, I, I need to say that this is a very special month, not just because, you know, but definitely because, you know, it's uh, certainly Mother's Day month. Uh, and we know how excited we all get about Mother's Day, but um, it's also it's also Mental Health Awareness Month. It's also Mental Health Awareness Month. And uh, as you all know, I'm a um, practicing clinician, mental health clinician and counselor. And, um, and so a lot of my research that um, I'm constantly doing, uh, certainly, you know, is in the area of mental health overall, but I like to focus, I like to focus a lot of my um, uh, education as far as mental health is concerned and, and mental health awareness around the black community. Uh, and so today I wanted to bring up a specific topic um, in the area of mental health. I did say, Earlier on, you know, when Justice and Flow was created, I did say that uh, we would always, you know, um, have conversations around black mental health, black mental health. So today I felt led to um, talk about Bishop, right? The um, social media, social media technology and its impact on our mental health, but also um, not just our mental health, but also the impact of social media, a social media usage on uh, relationships 
and not just um, intimate relationships, but there's a lot of research out there certainly being developed, you know, on uh, uh, about, you know, certainly the um, impact more directly on intimate relationships or certainly in marriages and whatnot. But uh, there's also uh, some research constantly being developed uh, from the American Psychological Association on its impact on relationships and um, social social development overall. Um, so I thought that this would would be a really important a really important topic to address. So I know it might sound boring right now, but just about everybody, I don't know anybody that's actually listening to the show today that don't use social media because you wouldn't be listening if you did. So we all use social media, but um, I just wanna bring some things to our awareness so that we can check the status of our usage of social media. So I'm gonna start this conversation off, Bishop, by reading something that I posted to Facebook uh, earlier, earlier last week, earlier last week. And I'm gonna read it. So it said this, and it was a long post, but it basically said this, Research is proving that social media is having no positive impact on intimate relationships and or our individual mental health. No matter how much we try and justify usage, the bad is outweighing any good. Matter of fact, and we witnessed the shift some 20 years ago before Facebook and Instagram, etc., that the internet cyberspace was quickly becoming the number one reason for divorce and crisis in relationships. Bottom line, you're not socializing and engaging authentically at all when you primarily use technology to interact. Therefore, those who primarily use it are socially inadequate with little to no interactive skills. Uh, and, but what I that should have said was interpersonal skills. That should have said interpersonal skills, okay? So check the following behaviors to access your status. If you wake up checking your social media and you go to bed checking your social media. If you spend more hours on social media than you do engage in meaningful conversation with people. If the likes from strangers matter more than the hearts of your loved ones. If you cannot have a discussion with someone important to you without being upset. If it is hard to listen and make eye contact while conversing or socializing. If you think texting someone is communication. How many of us think that texting is communication? If you upload personal videos from your personal space more than once a day. When your presence on social media is more important than your presence in life, i.e. home, in your marriage, in your family, at special occasions, special days, etc. When you think every day you need to share yourself with the world by posting your opinions, your goings and coming, what you're eating, how you're living to impress someone, that could care less. When you bring devices to the dinner table, <laughs> how many of us are guilty of that? These and some other reasons may be a sign that you are not only addicted to social media, but also depriving yourself of real loving, genuine and meaningful relationships that matter. When you die, none of those people will come to the funeral, nor check on your family to make sure that they are okay. So let me encourage you, us, to expend more energy on people that matter more than those that don't. Let me end this post by saying two things. If you cannot fast from social media for, more, for 30 days or more, you have an addiction. 
And also, if you are addicted, most likely your intimate relationships are suffering, maybe in silence, but nevertheless suffering. If this post has reached you, that means you have received this word. And if you have received this word, I need for you along with me to ask for the help of the Lord. Repent. Repent means to change y'all. Okay. And then go and check on the relationship that matter. And let's start the healing process. You don't have to die in an addiction. Just like with any addiction, we can recover. So be encouraged to do and to be better. That was the post that was on my heart. Again, based on some, some things that I have been exposed to and some research that I have read. Um, and then um, it's, it's a little bit more research that I want to um, uh, let you know about. So I, uh, I read this uh, article on COVID, COVID impact and mental health and the rise of uh, mental health disorders uh, since uh, COVID came along. And we already know that COVID has impacted the black community more drastically than any other community. And with that being said, our mental health is no different, right? Our mental health is no different. So uh, what I found out was before COVID, this was so interesting to me. Before COVID, black folks actually uh, was doing the best in areas of suicidal ideations, or committing suicide. We were what, doing the what, best. Do you, what do you mean the best? In other words, we were less likely to commit okay. suicide. Yeah, we was less likely, likely to commit suicide or to have suicidal ideations. Uh, and so with that being said, with that being said, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think that COVID would have impacted that. COVID has impacted that to the point to where it has tripled. We've, we've tripled um, and increased our number of people, the number of people, black people having suicidal ideations and uh, committing suicide, you know, since, since COVID. And that's been two years. That's been a little over two years. Did you want to ask a question, babe? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, so that's some of the research too. The other thing that I found out, you know, especially with the the influence of technology and the way that technology is and um, and what it's becoming, you know, as far as like uh, us disconnecting in our relationships, like, you know, so we living under the same rules, roof and uh, we're together, we're married and you have intimate relationships with this and the other, but these devices and technology and social media is actually not improving our social development, uh, not improving our interpersonal skills development, not improving our intimacy development. Uh, it's actually detracting from uh, all, all of those areas. Uh, found out that social media is social media usage. And the time that we spend on social media it increases our chances of developing a uh, clinical depression three to four times uh, more, three to four times more, uh, because we look at we look at this inauthentic stuff, this, um, th you know, and we compare ourselves. So, you know, a lot of people are depressed because they're not meeting this standard of beauty or they're not meeting this standard of living and they're not meeting you know, a, a lot of comparisons happen uh, through social media and it's causing a great deal of clinical depression. Um, now, and that's with adults as well. That's not just with children. That's with adults as well. So it's pretty bad. Um, and, you know, and I just thought that, you know, we needed to have conversations about this and I, I also thought that it would be important for us to, you know, kind of check our status and uh, and maybe even do an experiment of sorts or an exercise of sorts to see if we could fast from our social media uh, 
usage. One of the things I want to encourage people, you know, to do is, you know, we believe, you know, we we believe as a, a people of faith, we believe that everything should be done in, uh, you know, modestly. Um, and so, um, again, if you're spending more time on social media, using social media, connected to a device, then you are with people, you have a problem. That's that's just the bottom line. You have a problem. I'm not saying that the problem can't be fixed, but we need to acknowledge the fact that we have a problem. It's very, very easy for all of us to get addicted to technology right now. And it's very, very easy for us to also ignore the impact that it's having on our children. Just think about it. You know, children are not as social as they used to be. A, a lot of our kids are not as social as we were when we were children. We didn't have this. I'm 55. Bishop is 57. We but let me just finish this out. You know, I, I, I know you didn't like me saying your age, but you know, I, I don't mind because we didn't have this to contend with. And I, I, I just want back. Talk about the fact that when you was a kid, right? We used to be outside riding our bikes, right? Playing marbles. I was a tomboy when I was a kid. So I would be outside playing marbles. My brother taught me how to play touch football. I was outside with the boys playing football, playing basketball, playing baseball. I, You know, I did all of those sports. I knew how to play marbles. You know, I did all of that. These kids today, they don't even know what those games are. He, he, was, sin, he was sinning because the Bible said marble not. Um but but in any case, um, it, well, it, it, it's it's also it it has also led to the higher rates of obesity and health um, issues amongst young and old, mm-hmm. but clearly young folk because of the sedentary lifestyle that they live, um, where they're not as engaged in um, you know. Uh, you know, our thing was going down to the corner to play basketball or, or playing hide and go seek or, you know, uh, red light, green light, or, um, you know, games that they haven't even heard of before. I, I remember the last time I walked outside on some day and saw a group of black girls doing double dutch right. or, or hopscotch. I don't know nothing about it. Uh, uh, Cynthia, oh yeah. Uh, we used to go. Um, in a minute, oh yeah, jump in your chest. Oh I, yeah, they don't know about that. They don't know about it. Every Saturday, we would go to Rialto, which was a roller skating rink. You know, um, to roller skate, and you know, all that kind of stuff we did as kids because you know we. Right. That's what we did. Right. You know. And, and, Right. And and and, the, and here's the one saying, you know, I was watching uh, yesterday. They they did this thing about, you know, you had a black mom if you've ever heard these sayings. And um, you know, shut up crying before I give you something to cry about. You know, all all the all the black mama saying, well, I look like your little friends. You know, uh, and and you put a finger down if your mama ever said any of those things. Mm-hmm. One saying that. I don't hear as much from black mamas nowadays is go outside and play. Right. And, and we heard and we heard that all the time. All the time. Go outside. Folks would be in the house socializing, doing what adults do, watching TV, talking, playing cards, doing whatever they were doing. And the kids, if y'all was in the house making noise or something, you were getting in the way, so they would tell you, go outside and play. And we go outside and we figure out what to do when we got out there. Kids don't even go outside and play anymore. Well, you know, and some of that is not their fault. Some of it is the fear that's, you know, been put in the parents. You know, they scared to let their kids go outside and play because of all of the bad stuff that, you know. Oh, I get it. But I'm just, I, I, you know, our parents were very cautious as well. But they would tell us to go out in our backyard, you know. Um Go outside and play, you know. We put up a net and play volleyball. I mean, it was just all kinds of things. All of that. All of that. All of that. All of that. 
all of that. And um, and so you know the 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 influx and in the, the fast influx, like you know, you can't keep up with technology today. It moves so fast. It changes so fast. I was I was thinking of, of the other day. I got to get a new phone because you know I got an old iPhone. I mean it's it's good for me, but you know I, my apps are no longer. I'm no longer able to update my apps because my phone is too old. And I thought about the fact that I just had the 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 what is it? What do you call it, babe? The plugs put in the the house. USB. Yeah, yeah, the USB plugs, you know, put it all over the, the house. But, you know, when I get this new iPhone, it's a different kind of plug. So, in other words, I'm saying yeah, it's just so quick, you know, or whatever, you can't keep up with it. it. You know, it changes so quick. But, you know, it really, it really hurts my heart, though, that children are not as social um and and their social development is is deprived and kind of arrested if you will um you know today as opposed to in our day you know or whatever and um and and that frightens me because you know i don't care how good a device is i don't care how many ways we can say that having technology and having uh cell phones and having social media i don't care how many ways we can say it's good for this it's good for that at the same time a device don't have feelings a device don't have real feelings i can't say i can't say how often you know we try to use devices to communicate or relay a message and I can't say the number of times that those messages are misconstrued, um, um, misunderstood, and it causes, you know, it, it causes more rifts than good, you know. So I just want to go over um, some of the negative effects of social media, if that's okay. Bishop, was you about to say something? I just want to say that, did you brew that tea? Did I brew what tea? What are you drinking? Tea. Okay, so you brewed the tea. So for not only did she sin as a kid because it said marble not, she sinned as an adult because the Bible said Hebrews. All right, go ahead. How is that a sin? The Bible said Hebrews. He said Hebrews, but it didn't say he. That it, was a sin. It didn't say she brews. Shut it's, up. It's <laughs> Hebrews. Be quiet. <laughs> you always, you always saying something crazy. All right. Okay. So here's some of the negative effects. Um, this and this is just a few. Um, and we're taking calls. So if anybody want to call in and add to this conversation, please do. I don't want to be the only one talking. I really think that this is important. I hope it's not, but I really think this this is important. But here's some of the negative effects. Uh, decreased time. This is uh, on the relationship, and um, and and, and let's let's think beyond you know just our intimate relationships let's think about important relationships okay relationships with your your parents relationships with your children okay negative effects some negative effects is decreased time with your partner or with your children or with your parents decreased time um missed connections um, this one was interesting to me, but I, I think I understood it. Jealousy. Um, conflicts, ar conflicts arising from disagreements. Um, misunderstandings. Uh, negative comparisons. Negative comparisons. Um, and I already mentioned, you know, some others in the uh, post- um, that I made in the post that I made, but those are just some of those are just some of the negative effects of um, too much time or using social media to try to um, to try to nurture uh, uh, your relationships. So, what do you think, Bishop, about those things? 
I mean, it sounds like it's, it's worth um, it's worth everybody trying to implement. Um, the I, you know, I was negative effects. I was negative effects. That I was positive effects. This is the negative effects. Yeah, well, I, so I, the point I was going to make with that is I was at the drive-through yesterday with my son. Our son. And um, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I think he's yours. Um, <laughs> um, so I so I asked him. I asked him Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. I shouldn't have asked him because I wanted to go to Starbucks, but he and of course he he chose Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and um, so he said, and I said, why Dunkin' Donuts? He says, oh, because the food is better at Dunkin' Donuts. I prefer. Starbucks for the drinks, but Dunkin' Donuts for the food. And on Sundays, he always gets a breakfast sandwich. I get a coffee. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so we go to Dunkin' Donuts right across from the church. And the young lady, who could have been any more than maybe 20, um, when, I, when I pulled up to the window, she stood there. And so I, I put my phone up. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You know, my donkey app on the phone so she can scan it. She scans the app. She she hands me the, my, my coffee. She didn't say nothing to you, did she? Then she hands me the sandwich. Right. And then she looks away. And I, and I, I said to my son, I said, Steve, this is the problem that this social media age has done to young people they don't have basic social skills skills. and interact with people like there was no hello how are you today thank Mm -hmm. you so much nothing just Mm -hmm. i mean and 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 i was in the in the airport one time a young man early 20s and i'm going up to order he's standing at the register and I and you know sometimes I just gotta say something. I said, "Are you trying to get hello out your mouth or something?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's crazy that 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 just the basic human. And, and I worry about it because I worry about it too. How people, how do they do a job interview? Uh, how, 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 they, how, don't, how, they don't. I mean, you know. Th- how do they advocate for themselves or, or, or anything like that when you can't even talk to people just on a basic level? Right, right, right. right. It, it, it's you know, crazy. I don't, I don't know where the... I don't know where... Where... where oh, I don't even know how to say this, but like, in other words, we see this happening, right? We see it they don't see it because this is all they know so they don't see it we see the change in culture we see this shit. well it, it hit me years ago it's, it's scary for us but here's the thing education is not keeping up with it either like there's no there's no system in place to address it educationally either what's happening is you know these students right these students these children are being diagnosed with disorders mental health here's the other thing is is it's and and then the, the and their, mental health, their mental health their social skills and then just basic other skills like like the ability to write a, a complete sentence i mean it's it's like they really without an emoji, without an emoji. <laughs> really think that what they write on social how they write on social media or how they text right right you write a real sense no you don't use lol and abbreviations right in complete sentences you don't you don't do that when you're writing a paper and stuff like that you know it, it, i mean it's literally crippling them you know to where they almost seem illiterate mm-hmm. you know to, to some degree we would not be able to speak and articulate without being able to write, without being able, you know, to basic communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And so, you know, I, I, I'm concerned, you know. So, with, so, 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 so. You, know, you know, when I noticed it first, it goes back to when Talbert was younger, you know, our older son. You know, I remember the, the first time I brought him to the radio station with me. And I, and I started making a habit of bringing them every Monday holiday. So when we have Monday holiday, my show's on Monday, I bring them to the radio station. And I remember being in the radio station, and he kept looking at the record players. And he said, finally said, so, Dad, is that what a record player looks like? And it, it hit me for the first time. He never saw one. He, he had never been exposed to it. He didn't grow up during a time where record players were being used. You know, and so these young people grew up in a, a day and age where, you know, they get all their music. Everything is on here. Everything. They get their music on here. Uh, their social media is on here. Their text messaging is on here. So their whole life is wrapped up into a device. Yeah, their whole life is wrapped up into a device, and that creates a bigger problem because they almost, um, young people in particular, but, you know, like I said, the adults are on board with this, too. I was saying, I believe I was saying it yesterday to Sister Brandy because I was talking to her. She's on the line today. I was talking to her, and I said... I said it's crazy how attached we are to devices um and we don't even see that we're not that attached to people but here's the other thing here's the other hold up i just wanted to complete this thought and the the, the 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 reason why i say that is we can we can you know be in a rush we got a, an appointment you know and we leave the house you know or whatever case may be we running late and so on and so forth if we forgot our phone, we're going to turn around and we're going to go get that phone. We're going to say, I just got to be late because, you know, we're not going to go. We're not willing to go anywhere without our devices anymore. It's like our attachment. And I, I don't I don't know if we all recognize what a problem that is, because, you know, I, and, and, and I, I you know, listen, I'm guilty. You know, I've done it where, you know, I was running behind and this, that, and the other. I turned around and I sacrificed being late or whatever it was to go back and get my phone, you know, because I just wasn't willing not to have my phone. But I've left other people that made, was making me late or whatever the case was. I left them behind. And I'm like, what is going on to where it's more important to me to get the device as opposed to getting the person? So two things. <laughs> is is i think i believe for adults young people grew up with this this is their indoctrination this is their socialization mm -hmm. um for older folks who remember a time before this because if, if you're as old as i am i remember when cell phones first came out mm -hmm. and i had the first the first generation of cell phones that weren't even you couldn't hold them in your hand they were car phones you had to have installed in your car um, and, and that's when young black men would, were, they would buy the little fake plastic car phone antenna and put it on the back of their windshield to pretend they had a car phone in their car. Um, um, and, um, um, and then it morphed into what, what we have today. But for a lot of adults, it's about affirmation that they are missing in their other spheres of endeavor so whether it's on the job whether it's in the home whether it's in the relationship where it's they feel, in their relationship. Where, where they feel like they, they're not getting they're getting an affirmation on social media they're getting people to agree with them to like their post it's artificial. I, 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 but, but they get them to interact with them to agree to affirm them you and so, it's artificial. so they're looking for this affirmation from 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 other folks and then the other detrimental thing and here's the problem social media and electronic um devices 
can be great tools that can enhance whatever endeavor if we use it properly. The thing that really gets me is, is young folk know how to do everything else on a device, but y'all can't do basic research. The whole World Wide Web is at your fingertips. The information superhighway is right there, but you can answer certain basic questions and stuff that's readily available right in your face. Um, I, you know, I always ask this question of people, what's the latest book you read? You know, you know, cause I still believe readers make leaders and I still believe that, that people ought to be reading books and most black adults don't read books. I mean, and I, I'm not trying to insult our audience, but if you ask most of the folks in our listening audience, give me the name of two books you read last year. They wouldn't have any. Um, and literally, you can have on a device hundreds of books. That's that's how convenient it is. On your Kindle or your Google, you can literally have an entire library at your fingertips. You know, I used to buy physical books, and you know, because we have books all over the house, because I always have, you know, hard copy physical we have libraries. We do. We have everywhere. Libraries. Everywhere. And now I have probably a larger library on my Kindle mm -hmm. than I've got in the house of physical books. Mm -hmm. But then we won't use these. Well, see, that's, that's a good way to use technology. Right. But we won't use them for those types of things. That's one of the benefits of you using literally read a book every day you can put it on audio book and have it read to you exactly well that's that's what i would need to do you, you know because you know we don't we don't have the luxury a lot of us you know i'm, I'm speaking for a, a lot of mothers and women and wives and all of this you know we don't have the luxury to you know kind of relax or you know uh, we don't have good time management skills you know and this and, and the other and kind of relax and read but you know definitely using technology to listen and read you know that's a that's a good usage of technology but when you are only using technology and devices to socialize that's a problem because it's artificial you cannot i don't care if, if a device is in between your communication all the time and that's the only way you communicate it is artificial because it's been interrupted by a device that don't have real feelings that you know that you didn't see that you don't feel so that's why it's really important that we recognize that there is a way to use technology that will benefit us you know as opposed to using technology and thinking you know that i can use technology to nurture my relationships because we cannot you know we cannot use technology to nurture our relationships you have to you have to show up you have to be present in order to really nurture your relationships and you know those relationships that are important to you uh again you have to you have to prioritize your relationship in such a way to where if you do use technology you use it together i think you just brought up something bishop right you just brought up something i forget what you said but um i'm gonna this the analysis that i'm gonna present i oftentimes say um especially in relationships like ours where you know uh i'm married to a, a bishop and a pastor and let me tell y'all without technology without technology without devices without social media you know these kinds of uh, marriages it, it's it's hard it's hard to nurture a marriage you know when the 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 when you're married to a pastor you know and uh or whatever because it's just so much it's just so much that you got to sacrifice it's so much time so much resources you know um you know and, and you know and the spouse that's not the pastor you know she or he you know got to be willing you know to you know pretty much share her spouse you know or his spouse or 
or whatever the case may be with the congregation, with the church, with the ministry, with the national church and so on and so forth. So it can be heavy on the relationship as it is. And with the induction of or inclusion of a technology, if it's not used appropriately, it can bring more harm than good, you know, onto uh, that relationship. So typically the analogy that I use is that um, you have your individual relationship with God. You have your individual relationship with each other, your intimate relationship, right? And you do church together as a whole family. You know, you do church together as a whole family. You don't leave your children behind to do church, you know, or whatever. You do church together as a whole family, right? And that's that's the way that technology needs to be used. You know, you have your intimate relationship with your spouse. You have your intimate relationship, you know, or your important significant relationship with your children with your parents you know with your best friend whatever the case may be and y'all do technology y'all agree to do technology or use technology in certain ways you use it together you don't use it to have a conversation you don't use it you know uh to try to uh, talk something out or to disagree or to expose or to you know or whatever the case may be can I say it together. Go ahead. And let me say this. This is one of my, my own pet peeves. Listen. So when when my wife's birthday came, you know, I went to the store. I'm old school. I went to the store and bought some flowers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a card, so on and so forth. You know, came home you know to present it to her so on and so forth when when my children have birthdays you know I, you know I'll, I'll i'll do something tangible in your face i'll call them on the phone happy birthday so on and so forth listen to the some gen xers millennials and some gen wires putting a post in your stories putting a post on your social media or in your stories Telling and 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 when it comes to your friends and stuff, I don't care. But when it comes to your parents and and other significant people, a social media post saying "Happy Birthday" that don't cut it. Pick up the phone and have some human interaction. Okay, that is so impersonal. That's that's not what you do with people that you have relationship with. It does not suffice because. What you put on social media is for the benefit of other folk. I don't need for you to, if you want to acknowledge me that way, that's fine. But if you my child, my grandchild, my spouse, somebody, tell me to my face, happy birthday, happy Father's Day, or whatever the case may be. Um, it, it don't count. It, but, but that's the socialization is that they think it doesn't count unless it's, unless it's on social media. Or, or it did happen. Yeah. Um, see, and that's the other, that's kind of the other problem. And that also is a, a somewhat of the reason why, you know, you, you're dealing, they are dealing with so much depression. Uh, again, because, you know, when people, typically when people post, you know, there always are exceptions, of course. But typically when people post, they're trying to show you the best of them. You know, they're they're trying to impress you, or they're you you know what I'm saying. And so, um, there was there was something that happened. I think she was a blogger, a blogger, right? That's a video uh, blogger, right? You know, that's a video person. You know, and she always had like this lavish, you know, background and so on and so forth. You know, and so you know, she always was presenting herself as this glamorous, you know, lavish. This is, you know, this is what I did in here and this is what, you know, and this is what I got on the day and designer this, designer that. And I can't remember exactly what happened, but something happened to where the police had to go to her home. And so the truth of how she was really living was exposed 
uh, by the police going to her home. So really, um, really, she lived in, you know, in really poor conditions. She didn't clean her house at all. It was a mess. It was a hot mess. Uh, it was a really, you know, deplorable conditions that, you know, that she was living in, but she was able to make this presentation to the rest of the world. And, you know, she was this famous, you know, like I said, blogger and she was making money off of Facebook, not Facebook, um, YouTube and all of that kind of stuff, you know, or whatever, because of the presentation she was making, you know, to the rest of the world. But that was not her truth. And that's what we need to recognize a lot when it comes to social media is that, you know, we see this stuff, but you know, 90% of it is lies. 90% of it is fake. You know, 90%, you know, 90% of it is untrue. I got into trouble a few times because uh, things had came up, you know, I read it and I was like, oh, you know, or whatever. And I shared it. And then I found out later on, it wasn't even true. It was, you know, that it wasn't um, a legitimate source, you know, and so on and so forth. So you got all of that to contend with. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation. And uh, and half, most of us don't know how to check the sources. Most of us just take it and read it and run with it, you know. Most of us just take it and see it and run with it. Most of us, you know, take it and see it and think, oh, you know, I can achieve this. I can achieve that. I mean, a really good example is all of these fake, um, what what do they call them, Instagram models? Yeah. Or whatever, you know, all of these, you know, fake Instagram models, you know, uh, glamorous looks, you know, you know, and uh, these, um, I don't know, 36, 24, 36 bodies and so on and so forth. And then, you know, when you find out none of it is natural, mm -hmm. none of it is natural. Like everything on them is fake, you know, and it's sad because most of them are beautiful women or were beautiful women before they started, you know, going down this, this, uh, rabbit hole of, you know, trying to achieve you know all this fakeness it's really sad what's happening and the weight on our mental health the weight on our self-esteem the weight on our confidence you know and i don't want my young ladies listen daughters you know babies out there i don't want y'all uh going through life you know wasting your time chasing after this fictitious stuff you know that don't matter you are beautiful as you are in all of your naturalness you know um you know the way that god made you you don't need to achieve you know this fake this fake stuff because in the end if it doesn't kill you it's gonna it's gonna destroy your temple um one of the shows that i've been watching lately is um killer body with my what's her name k michelle with K. Michelle, Killer Body with K. Michelle. If y'all haven't seen it, just go and watch one episode. Just go and watch one episode, just in case you or somebody you know uh, is thinking about, you know, getting some type of a uh, surgery, you know, some type of modification, some type of a uh, surgery, you know, to uh, achieve a certain kind of physical look, you know, or whatever case may be. Go in and watch Killer Body with K. Michelle. Um, and see if you don't change your mind. I hope you do. Listen, do not, and 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 this is a good point made by Sister Selena. Young folks use don't use their brain; they use Siri. Um, too. Um, they Google it is the is the order of the day. It, it's like people they depend so heavily on Google that they don't bother reading or doing research or learning for themselves because they feel like anything they want to know, I'll just Google it. Mm -hmm. And like you said, everything on the internet isn't factual. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there. So just you Google misinformation then real, inf real right. information. Just because you Google it, don't make it factual. Doesn't. 
for every fact you come up with through Google, I can find something that says the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, which is why you need to learn, read, do research for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there's no substitute. You, you know, develop your brain power. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. It's important. I mean, it, it, it's out there. Utilize it for the good. But see, there's a saying a preacher friend of mine always says is when you don't know the purpose of a thing, you're bound to abuse it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what basically has happened. You know, mm -hmm. all of the, the whole World Wide Web Internet was created supposedly to be the information superhighway so we could have access to information mm -hmm. um, and the original purpose of it has, has has long now been abused and continues to be abused and so any and everything can happen now mm -hmm. you get um sexual exploitation um at just about any social media app you have you can find pornography, uh, underground sexual exploitation, all kinds of stuff um, that, are, that are being used. It, it's, it's, it's used as um, organizing ground for white supremacist groups and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So uh, in addition to trying to temper our habits around social media, we also have to be very cautious uh, of it. Um, and and the inordinate amount of influence that it has uh, on people who may go down a rabbit hole and get caught up in some stuff that they should not get caught up in all through its influence as well. Well, so so that's a perfect segue, you know, for me to just kind of end the show today with some tips on reclaiming our relationships, you know, through, um, with, you know, we're contending with these uh, social media and uh, technology and uh, um, also, you know, all of these devices. So here are the tips that I'm going to end the show with today. Um, number one, set boundaries regarding usage of social media. So in other words, um, uh, some of the tips that I strongly encourage do not bring um, devices to the dinner table. And eat dinner together go to the dinner table you know make it when you cook ladies or you know men you know because anybody can cook any anyway but when you cook or whatever have a dinner time try to have a dinner time if you can't have a dinner time you know through the week because a lot of times we're ships passing through the night you know whatever because we're so busy you know as a family but have at least one day a week where you sit down as a family and you eat together now that day tends to be sundays for us if no other day through the week that day tends to be sundays for us but uh i encourage all of us please sit down at the dinner table together have dinner as a family and no devices have a bowl or something like that on your dinner table and have everybody put their cell phones or whatever in that bowl so you can eat together or whatever case may be spend some time social socializing with each other interacting with each other uh interacting with important people the other place you shouldn't bring devices to is bed especially those of us who are married do not bring devices to the bed to the bed um me and bishop you know we're guilty of that and what i found is we're on the devices and we're not saying nothing to each other and that's not good that's not healthy and that's not nurturing uh your relationship an important relationship uh to each other date night date night uh especially those of us who um have committed or in committed relationships is important to have at least one date night a week you don't have to go out but you need to dedicate at least two hours uh, a week to each other again no devices if you go out no devices no no usage of devices everybody don't need to know that y'all out on a date you know or whatever case may be no devices interact with each other um 
Be cognizant of what you're posting. So in other words, you know, don't just take pictures, videos or whatever um, it, 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 of, of your partner, your family or whomever and just put it up without their knowledge. You know, have conversations with people that, you know, you, you, you're you taking videos of, pictures of or whatever to see if they're okay with you uh, posting their picture or video or whatever one of the things that i had to talk to my husband about and this was a while ago and he's he's he understood um you know he would just you know take his pictures or his videos and he would put up his post and this that and the other and i asked him i said i don't i don't want you doing that at, at our house i feel like our home is sacred so you know that space is sacred so you know, talk to your partner, talk to your, you know, your loved one and find out how they feel about the spaces that you're in and you're, you know, you're using your devices or your social media or whatever uh, with the world. Be transparent and be honest. Um, there are such things as what we call social media betrayals. And I'm telling you, uh, I, I think I might have said this a little bit earlier, um, social media technology and the usage of the internet has become the number one reason uh, for a divorce. It used to be finances, um, but I, you know, I still believe that. You know, finances in there. other words, don't be sliding up in nobody else's DMs. <laughs> okay, it's very easy today. It's very easy to, today to get caught up in emotional affairs, and you know, certainly, you know, to be inappropriate. You know, <laughs> to be inappropriate. I mean, like. Um, I, I mean, this hasn't happened, but I'm just, this is just an example of something that I know about. So, you know, one of those, uh, what is it? I, I just, I just said it, Instagram models, whatever, you know, she showing her backside and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff and the husband on there liking it. That ain't cool. It's disrespectful. Oh, oh, and, 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 and please know that because I see a lot of it's it, it kills me because I see a lot of my, you, you can't control what shows up on your timeline as you're scrolling. But what always kills me is, is when I'll scroll past some stuff that is, you know, not really cool to be on there. And I'll see some preacher friend or something because it shows you your friends who like it. It'll say liked by on Instagram. So it'll say like, by, and I'll be, be like, and I'll be looking at like, Bishop, did you really like that? I mean, I mean, if you liked it, okay, but you really clicked the like button, like my nigga. I mean, <laughs> oh, you always gotta mess it up. Stop it. <laughs> I'm like, stop that. <laughs> they can see that, y'all. I'm just letting y'all know they can see that. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just not a good look. I mean, you know, so. You know, we just gotta, you know, we, 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 it's real easy, it's real easy to, you know, for these devices to, you know, trip us up and have us out there, you know, looking crazy. So, you know, if your relationship matters to you, um, if you love your spouse and stuff, uh, you, you'll take a look at what's happening with your social media usage. You'll take a deeper look at how you're using it and you you'll you'll have a conversation with your loved one and loved ones right and you will say okay i want to make sure um that i see you that i hear you um that you know that i prioritize you um that i'm showing you love uh that you don't feel some kind of way if if i happen you know along your, your page or whatnot and um and you know i just want to make sure that you know you're not offended by anything that you see or whatever um this this is something totally unrelated but my husband had a post up the other day and i mean he didn't say anything disrespectful to me it wasn't anything that um that you know could have uh interfered with our marriage or our relationship in that way but, you know, what he said, you know, made me uh, concerned for 
what he was looking like. And so I said, babe, you know, take that down, you know, cause I, I don't want that being misconstrued. I don't want people, you know, looking at you a certain way. And I don't want the family that's mentioned in the post, you know, to be hurt or triggered, you know, by reading that. And so he listened to me, uh, because again, you know, once again, if you're using social media together and you care about each other and how, you know, you look as a couple and so on and so forth, um, that's just important to you. So make sure that those doors are open and you're able to have those kinds of conversations with, uh, those important relationships that matter. Because like I said, at the end of the day, when you die, Ain't none of those people that done sent up these hearts and, you know, put in the comments, oh, Bishop, you so great, and this, that, and the other, so on and so forth. When, when, they, when he die, ain't none of them gonna make sure he got life insurance. Ain't none of them gonna make sure that I'm okay. What they gonna do, they gonna, they gonna, they gonna, they gonna, they gonna his kids and his grandkids are okay. Ain't none of that stuff is gonna matter. So the only people that matter should matter. They're going to look for a picture that we might have taken or, or they're going to put my picture up and they're going to say, oh, my good friend, rest in peace. Exactly. You know, rest in, rest in power, Bishop, rest in power, Bishop. But ain't nobody going to, you know, come and make sure that First Lady and her kids and her grandkids and, you know, or whatever is okay. So, like I said, y'all, let's just make sure that we watching it. So do a little experiment, you know, do a little experiment. See if you can fast, you know, for three days from social media. Start with three days before you build up to the 30 days. Well, I've been fasting from these grits, so I'm ready to break it. So I do recommend that we get to the point to where we fast. From, I do it every year where we fast from social media for 30 days, for 30 days. But again, you know, if you can't do it for three hours, then you got a problem. <laughs> uh, we got to go. We went overtime and we went after we went to the after after show. Um check us out again next Monday. Same time, same fast station. All right. We out. Deuces. See ya.